The Lord be with you. Welcome to worship on this 15th Sunday after Pentecost. I am Sherry Shaw, Deacon and Minister of Music at Anuste Lutheran Church in Gig Harbor, Washington. On behalf of the whole community of Anuste, thank you for being part of our worship this morning. Our building may be closed, but the church is always open. Our worship bulletin with the order of service may be downloaded. The link is located in the box below the video that you are watching under Show More. Today we remember in prayer Sister Anne, Pastor Mary Sanders, and the United Lutheran Church Congregation and the Mission de Belen Congregation following the arson of fire that destroyed their fellowship hall and classrooms last Sunday evening. These are the two other congregations that Sister Anne serves. If you would like to contribute to their fire recovery, there's a place to do so on their website, unitedlutherantacoma.org. We pray for all those along the Gulf Coast who were affected by Hurricane Sally this week. We continue to pray for all those affected by the devastating wildfires in Washington, Oregon, and California. We pray for healing for Martha Johnson following her knee surgery. I invite you to turn in your bulletin as we continue our worship with the greeting. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Almighty and eternal God, you show perpetual loving kindness to us, your servants. 
Because we cannot rely on our own abilities, grant us your merciful judgment and train us to embody the generosity of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. A reading this morning is from Jonah chapter 3. When God saw what the people of Nineveh had did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. But this was very displeasing to Jonah, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, is not this what I said while I was still in my own country? That is why I fled to Tarshish at the beginning, for I know that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and ready to relent from punishing. And now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Is this right for you to be angry? Then Jonah went out of the city and sat down east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade, waiting to see what would become of the city. The Lord God appointed a bush and made it come up over Jonah to give shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was very happy about the bush. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the bush so that it withered. When the sun rose, God prepared a sultry east wind and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint and asked that he might die. He said, it is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the bush? And he said, yes, angry enough to die. Then the Lord said, you are concerned about the bush for which you did not labor and which you did not grow. It came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should I not be concerned about Nineveh, the great city in which there were more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also many animals? Word of God, word of life.
The Holy Gospel according to the 20th chapter of Matthew. Jesus said to the disciples, For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace, and he said to them, You also go into the vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again about noon, and again about three o'clock, he did the same. And about five o'clock, he went out and found others standing around him. And he said to them, Why are you standing here idle all day? They said to him, Because no one has hired us. He said to them, You also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, Call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those hired around five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now when the first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I was doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. This is the Gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Okay. You know when you're a kid and maybe something happens that you don't quite agree with or a sibling takes something or gets something that you think should be yours or your parents make a decision about something. There's a certain phrase that comes to mind in that situation a phrase that has been heard, I'm sure, through the millennia of childhood. The phrase is, that's not fair. Okay, maybe even you adults out there say that too sometimes, right? Right. And then, after you or one of your siblings would say, that's not fair, what would your mom or dad or grandma or grandpa say, there's a standard response after that, right? That's not fair. Then you hear, well, life's not fair, right? It wasn't just my mom, was it? I think it's one of those universal parenting phrases, just like that cry against unfairness is a universal kid complaint. I don't even know how many times I said, that's not fair, and then heard, well, life isn't fair when I was growing up, but it's a good amount. And I'm sure as my kids start to get a little bit older that I'll be saying right back at them too. But you know what? I hate to break it to you, but your mom was right. My mom was right. Life isn't fair. At least... Not in the way that we usually think about fairness. This is what Jesus is telling us in this parable from Matthew chapter 20. Our ideas of fairness and equality are pretty different from God's ideas of fairness and equality. And they are much, much, much harder to live out. So how is Jesus' definition of fairness different from ours? Well, first, let's think about how we usually define fairness in our world. What makes something or a situation or an outcome fair? The first thing we might think of is equal distribution, right? Like my mom, even though she would say life's not fair, she always made an effort every year to make sure that each three of us kids got the same amount of presents at Christmas under the tree. That made it fair. 
this is funny because my husband and I often get into arguments about what it means to be fair when we split our household duties and chores. Because of my mom and me growing up, I'm very conscious of things needing to be very fair or equal, right? That's what I mean when I say fair in this context. And I will voice my concern when it's not. But my husband did not have this same kind of uh, stress on equality uh, growing up. And so for him, he doesn't have that same instinct that I do. He thinks it's fine that every once in a while we, we take turns shouldering different shares of the responsibilities. That's just how it works out in a marriage and in families. You know, the funny thing, we just had an argument that when you boil it down, this was really what it was about just today. It was about whose turn was it to wake up with the four-year-old when he came bursting into the room, as he does at 6.30 a.m. every day, when his little uh, light-up alarm clock goes off. And we usually take turns getting up with him. And uh, we argued about whose turn was it. And I had said, well, I did it yesterday, so it's not fair for me to do it today. (laughs) Anyone else have these kind of arguments in the relationship about fairness? Another way we think about fairness is in terms of payments, right? or wages, or work, like in the parable. We think that we do certain work, or a certain amount of work, and we respect, expect to receive a certain amount of payment or reward. We get this for that. And we don't really like exception to these rules, right? We want to know that everyone else has worked just as hard and as long as we have to earn that paycheck, right? Can't have anyone freeloading while we work our keisters off, right? You might have noticed so far that our ideas about what make things fair are mostly transactional. You do this or get this, and I do this or get this. It's about expectations of value. Our hard work and the consequent pay we get from it tells us how much value we hold in our world. In some ways, even tells us who we are. I think that's why this country, in this country, we are so addicted to that idea of, you know, pulling up your bootstraps and uh, starting with a dollar in your pocket and becoming a millionaire. The harder you work, the more you suffer, the more you earn, the more our lives have value at least in our world. So what does Jesus have to say about all this? His parable sure makes us rethink our definition of fairness. In this story, the workers are not paid based on the number of hours they work. They each receive the same pay, a full day's wages, even those who started late in the evening. And of course, those workers who started early in the day Start up that familiar old refrain, that's not fair. They think that they should be paid more than the guys who came later. And according to the norms of our economy and theirs, they should, right? They worked longer, they should get more. But you know what? This isn't a story about our economy. This is a story about God's economy. God's economy doesn't run on money earned and hours worked. God's economy runs on grace, pure and simple. It's not about earning something or who gets what or how much or comparing that to someone else. God's grace is free, abundant, and for everyone, no matter what. And in God's world, that, God's economy, that is where we find our true value. But then I wonder, why is that grace so darn hard for us to accept? And why is it even harder for us to live by? Take Jonah, for example. 
This is a guy who had a hard time accepting grace. Now, don't get me wrong, he was fine accepting it for himself, right? In the part of his book we read today, he welcomes the tree or the bush that God grows for him and the shade it provides, even though he's in the middle of this epic temper tantrum. But he does not want that grace to be there for others, too. He especially does not want that grace to be there for those terrible Ninevites. And how often do we find ourselves thinking something similar? We are usually more than happy to accept gifts or bonus or favor or something just a little extra when it is for ourselves or for our community. But so many of us just hate to see something good happen to those people, those ones who haven't earned it, haven't worked hard enough for it, or don't deserve it, in our opinion. But the thing is, the really hard thing is, the gift that is God's grace doesn't depend at all on our earning or working or deserving. So why do we put up so many limits on what we give each other in this life when God doesn't do that to us? In this story, Jesus is calling us, his disciples, to be generous stewards of the resources we've been given. He's asking us to operate our lives on God's economy of grace instead of the economy of wages and earning. And he doesn't ask this just theoretically of something you believe. He's asking us to do this in real ways that change our lives and the lives of others. This is how we can create a world where we all have enough. Enough to eat, enough to survive, and even enough to thrive, where we all have fulfilling, interesting work, opportunities for lifelong education, abundant health and wellness. We can create a world that has enough space for everyone to contribute from their talents and skills, not only surviving, but thriving. We just keep getting in our own way when we don't want to spread that grace of God around and share what we've been given. So I ask you, what is something in your life that you can shift to the new operation system under an economy of grace? Perhaps a relationship. Perhaps a donation or an organization that you're involved with. Perhaps it's with, if you're a business owner, how you treat employees or anyone who works for you. Because we could all just, if we could all just do that, operate from the economy of grace, with God's help, we could seriously change this world for the better. Can I get an amen? Thanks be to God.
drawn together in the compassion of God, we pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. Generous God, you make the last first and the first last. Where this gospel challenges the church, equip it for its work of service. Strengthen those who suffer for Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Our beloved earth, O God, is crying out to us for the damage we have caused. Our neighbors are, who are most negatively affected by the devastation of our natural world are crying out for racial and environmental justice. We have allowed the burden of extreme weather events, unhealthy air and toxic water to fall heaviest on the poor, on indigenous peoples and on people of color. We repent for our harmful actions and our complicit inaction. Breath of God, move us to repair our relationships with those whom we have hurt and with our Mother Earth. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, where we find envy and create enemies, you provide enough for all. Bring peace to places of conflict and violence. Inspire leaders with creativity and wisdom. Bless the work of negotiators, peacekeepers, and development workers. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving God, reveal yourself to all in need as you are gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, ready to relent from punishment. Accompanying judges and lawyers, victims of crime, and those serving sentences, give fruitful labor and a livelihood to those seeking work. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful God, you choose to give generously, even beyond our expectations. Give us compassion and understanding as we deal with the uncertainties of the coronavirus in these days. Grant life, health, and courage to all who are in need, especially those we name silently or aloud. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, guide your servant, Pastor Seth. Give him refreshment during this time of sabbatical rest. Fill him with your spirit and enrich his life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy God, in you alone we find safety and shelter. Be a sure refuge to all suffering from wildfires. Grant courage, protection, and favorable weather to firefighters and emergency responders. Embrace all who are newly displaced or homeless with supportive communities. Comfort those grieving all that have been destroyed and give patience to those who are anxious, not knowing when relief will come. Heal your whole creation that out of flame and ashes new growth will spring forth. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of all ages, we praise you for the generations that have declared your power to us, especially your servant, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Give us faithfulness to follow them living for Christ until you call us to join them in their joyful song around his throne. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All these things and whatever else you see that we need, we entrust to your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. As we individually prepare the elements for Holy Communion in our homes, we give thanks to each of you who have contributed to the ministry of Anus Day with your tithes and offerings. Thank you for your generosity. Please join me in helping our ministry be sustained and grow by following the link in the video description to donate your gift now. Even though we cannot gather physically, we can still offer our gifts together 
to do God's work. We are now entering into a time of communion together. If you're planning to receive the sacrament today, make sure that you have some bread or a cracker and wine or juice ready. If you are not planning to receive communion today, please join me in praying the Eucharistic prayer as found in your bulletin, as together we welcome the presence of Jesus into our hearts and our homes this day. Let us pray. Blessed are you, compassionate and faithful God, and how wonderful the work of your hands. As a mother tenderly gathers her children, you embraced a people as your own and filled them with longing for a peace that would last and for a justice that would never fail. Through countless generations, your people hungered for the bread of freedom. From them, you raised up Jesus, the living bread, in whom ancient hungers were satisfied. He healed the sick, though he himself would suffer. He offered life to sinners, yet death would hunt him down. With a love stronger than death, he opened wide his arms and surrendered his spirit. Loving God, let your Holy Spirit move in power over us and over our earthly gifts of bread and wine, that they may become the body and blood of Jesus Christ. On the night before he met with death, Jesus came to the table with the women and men he loved. He took bread and praised you, God of all creation. He blessed and broke the bread and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat it. This is my body, which will be given up for you. Do this for remembrance of me. When supper was ended, he poured the final cup of wine and blessed you, God of all creation. He passed the cup among his disciples and said, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. This is the cup of my blood the blood of the new and everlasting covenant. It will be shed for you and for all, so that sins may be forgiven. Do this in memory of me. Together let us proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Ever gentle God, we commemorate Jesus, your Son. Death could not bind him, for you raised him up in the spirit of holiness and exalted him as the first of creation. May his coming and glory find us ever watchful in prayer, strong in love, and faithful to the breaking of the bread. Rejoicing in the Holy Spirit, your whole church offers thanks and praise with all your servants whose lives bring hope to this world. Awaken to the undying light of pardon and peace those who have fallen asleep in faith. Gather them all into communion with all your saints. 
Then at last will all creation be one, and all divisions healed, and we shall join in singing your praise through Jesus Christ's eternal word. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, all loving God, now and forever. Amen. Together let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sin as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. For those of you who are not receiving communion today, receive this blessing. May you know the boundless, unearned, unconditional, life-changing grace of God as seen through the life, death, and resurrection of our God on earth, Jesus Christ, today and always. Amen. If you are receiving communion today, receive this promise. This is the body of Christ given for you. And this is the blood of Christ shed for you. Now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace now and always. Amen. God of the welcome table, in this meal we have feasted on your goodness and have been united by your presence among us. Empower us to go forth sustained by these gifts so that we may share your neighborly love with all. Through Jesus Christ, the giver of abundant life. Amen. The Lord bless us and keep us. The Lord's face shine upon us with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon us with favor and give us peace. Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us today. Please join us every Sunday morning at 945 for worship and every Wednesday evening at 7 p.m. to pray Vespers using Holden Evening Prayer. I invite you to visit our website www.agnusdaylutheran.org for information on ways you can connect with some of our ministries. Today, the book group meets on Wednesday, tech study, prayer shawl, knitting group, and choir all meet via Zoom. For more information on local ways to serve, 
simply click on the Ministries tab at the top of our website. Please take note of a special congregational meeting. Today, all voting members of Anuste are encouraged to attend a special congregational meeting following worship. This meeting will take place via Zoom during our usual virtual fellowship time at 1030. Our finance committee and church council will present options to handle our current financial deficit. A vote by the congregation will be taken at this meeting, so please plan to attend. The Zoom link for our Sunday worship time, Sunday fellowship time will be used for this meeting. This link is located at the end of the bulletin, on the events page of our website, and also in the weekly All Church email. And now go in peace. Christ is with you. I invite you to share the peace of Christ with someone by making a phone call, sending a text, or an email. Please join us for the special congregational meeting following the service. God bless you this week and always.